Hi, it's David here from Parts and Pumps. In this video, I'm going to run through the servicing of a Seco EL Series single head pump. A twin head is just the same, but twice. So if you have a twin head pump, this should still be a helpful video. I'm going to run through a full service magnet replacement, and as part of the service, we'll obviously be replacing the diaphragms. The most common cause of failure is when the diaphragms fail. In theory, Seco recommend replacing these discs annually, though hardly anybody does that. Instead, they tend to wait for them to suffer from material fatigue and tearing. Diaphragms can last quite some time, maybe two years or more. And bearing in mind that they move backwards and forwards 50 times a second, and the pumps are often running 24-7, 365 days a year, it's amazing they last as long as they do. But eventually they will tear, and you will have to replace them. First thing we need to remember is that we're dealing with mains electricity, so ensure the pump is isolated from the mains supply before conducting any kind of servicing. The first thing to do is to check the filter. Undo the single screw in the top and prise the top off. Sometimes they can be a little bit stiff to get off as they can be firmly clipped down. But with the screw out you can pull away and expose the filter compartment. The filter should be relatively clean, perhaps a bit of dust or a spider or two. And they can be washed in soapy water. Make sure you leave them to dry overnight, perhaps in an airing cupboard so they're absolutely dry before you reinstall them. You can also turn them through 90 degrees to offer a clean corner to the inlet holes which sit underneath them. Seco recommend an annual filter change, and you should certainly be looking at maybe washing them every three or four months. To gain access to the insides, you need to undo the bolt, grip washer, and nut from the corner of each part of the casing. The nut will fall out from underneath the corner, so get ready to catch it, and put to one side ready for reassembly. It's quite possible that the upper casing won't lift off, as they're often sealed to the lower part of the casing by a rubber gasket. There is a slot in one corner of the casing specifically designed to enable you to insert a flat bladed screwdriver to help break that seal and allow you to open up the pump. Be slow and gentle lifting the top casing away from the base, as there are often some cables connecting the two parts for the service light. Lift off the acoustic wrap and place to one side for reinstallation later. This isn't a filter, it just helps keep the pump quiet. We now have the internal core visible. If your pump has stopped and the service light or your external beacon is lit, chances are you will have a split diaphragm. The quickest way to check this is to pop the lid of the internal core off. Some of the larger ER pumps are shipped without an internal lid. This is to help with cooling for the more powerful pumps. So if your core doesn't have a lid, it's not been forgotten. It's not there for a reason. Take off the four screws and keep them separate, as they are a different length to the other screws which hold the valve box and diaphragms on. We can now see the autostopper switch with the magnet shuttle behind and the drive coils which make the magnet move from this angle left and right 50 times a second. The ends of the magnet are attached through the center of two rubber discs or diaphragms and they're contained within two valve boxes or covers. The air is generated in pulses by the two diaphragms and this air is collected by the valve boxes and pushed down these two pipes into the labyrinth base and ultimately down to the pipework in the system where the air is required. If you have the ability to check it it's worth just taking a continuity meter across the two solder joints on the switch to make sure that the autostopper switch has not been affected by the ingress of foul air from the tank system. We found that when the switch fails, the most likely cause is the smelly gas from within the tank finding its way back to the pump compartment. Those gases can corrode the small amount of copper in the micro switch, which is inside the autostopper switch and causes the switch to fail. If your pump has experienced a switch failure, it's important to make sure that the compartment the pump is sitting in is completely sealed from the tank. Where the pipe leaves the compartment to go down into the tank, it must be sealed. Maybe with silicon or a rubber gasket, or perhaps even some expanded foam. If you have a continuity signal between these two contacts, it's more likely that the switch is just fine. A clue that corrosive gases are at work may often be spotted on the inlet air filter. If there are any sticky or oily residues on the filter or compartment lid, as shown here from a different pump, it's a sign that there is some of that gas getting back to the pump. If you see some, and it hasn't already damaged the pump, it's only a matter of time before it does, so it's a wise move to fix that problem as fast as you can. If you don't have a meter to check the continuity through the switch, and you fiddle with the switch until you're losing the will to live without any success, you might want to cobble together a piece of wiring, perhaps similar to what we've got here, to bypass the autostopper switch entirely. If when powered up, the pump then starts, it's quite likely that that switch does need replacing. If you're applying power with a lid off, ensure you're standing away from the pump, remembering that this is live mains electricity and it doesn't like you. Make sure you isolate the pump from the mains again before continuing any service. 
Moving on, we're going to do a full service on this pump, so we need to take the pipework off the valve box nozzles so we can get to the diaphragms. Squeeze the steel clips and slide them down to the bottom of the pipes. Gently prise off the pipe from the nozzle of the valve boxes and then turn the pipes through 90 degrees so you've got easier access to the screws on the valve boxes. Use a good quality, properly fitting cross-bladed screwdriver. Making sure you don't take the heads off the screws is easily done and that can create a devil of a game to get them out. Often the valve box will now come off, exposing the diaphragms, but if you need to you might just need to use a thin flat bladed screwdriver in the slot between the diaphragm ring and the valve box just to break the seal. The diaphragms are now exposed. A 7mm spanner like this is probably your best bet to release the diaphragm off the end of the magnet. You may need to use a screwdriver, or maybe your thumb, to push the magnet down from the other end so that it slips underneath the autostopper switch as you pull it. Don't get the magnet near anything that can be badly affected by a strong magnetic field. They are very strong, and will happily catch your fingers if you are not careful. From this angle you can actually see the edge of the switch. It's the coloured part shown just here. They can be white, or grey, or blue, depending on the model of pump you have. That's the bit you need to reset when you want to restart the pump after you've finished the maintenance. If you're refitting the diaphragms, make sure you notice where the aperture on the frame is and match it up to the part of the casing that receives it. Offer the magnet with the first diaphragm already bolted on back onto the casing. Be careful not to catch your fingers as they tend to suddenly jump in because of the strength of the magnets. Now using the nylon spacer strips that come in the service kit, or now in the diaphragm packs, this will help you fight the magnetic pull of the magnets which will really try hard to stick the magnet shuttle to one side of the slot or the other. It doesn't matter which way around the magnet is installed, despite there being a north or south marking on the magnet, just in case you were wondering. Offer up the valve box, bearing in mind that the aperture needs to link up to the hole in the diaphragm frame. Now, we've found an extra trick here. When you offer up the valve boxes, put all the screws in, but keep everything really loose. So when you pull out the nylon spacers at this stage, you'll get a little bit of play maybe a millimetre or two, one way or the other, and that may well be enough to enable you to fine-tune the centralisation of the magnet, and that's really important. So when you've got that magnet as centralised as possible, it's time to tighten up the screws on both valve boxes. Turn the pipes back round so they're facing the valve box nozzles, and gently ease them on, bringing the clip back up, and then turn it downwards so it doesn't buzz against the external casing when the pump is powered back up. We now need to finally check that the autostopper switch is centralised before we close everything up. This image shows the autostopper with the sliding part shown extending to the left. In this state the pump wouldn't start, although the service light would most likely come on. In order for the pump to start running again the autostopper switch needs to be centralised. They're very stiff so you may not be able to centralise it just with your fingers alone. So you may need to use a flat bladed screwdriver to gently centralise the sliding part of the switch. If you're happy that everything is centralised, it's time to pop the lid back on, assuming you had one to begin with. Tuck the acoustic wrap back down, and then slide the external casing down over the internal core, making sure you've not trapped any cables. Refit the bolt, washer and nut to each corner of the casing. Refit the lid to the filter compartment. You can now apply power to the pump, and you're good to go. If the pump doesn't restart, you may need to go back a few steps to check that autostopper switch, as that's the most likely cause of the pump not restarting. If after all of this your pump still won't start, just call us, because we might yet be able to get your pump working again.